<laughs> Quick summary. This is April. <laughs> Here before, Dr. Lubin from the University of uh, Rochester in New York. And so we're very excited to hear what she has to say. I will stop talking so people can talk. Awesome. Yes, I'm April Lubin. I'm so honored to be here. My pronouns are she, her. Um, it was a little bit of an adventure to get to Flagstaff, but now I've learned a lot about the geography of Arizona, though I have more, much more to learn. Um, I have been at Warner School for, this is my 22nd year maybe, and I went there for their explicit commitment to social justice. Like that is their mission statement. We live it, we use it at faculty meetings to like make sure that we are staying true, uh, keeping our true north. So I'm glad to be there. Um, I don't expect that you, oh, okay, that's not working anymore. Well, maybe just click on the screen. Okay, know where Rochester is because <laughs> when I flew there for my job talk, I didn't know where Rochester was. I'm like, what am I doing? Anyway, it's between Buffalo and Syracuse on Lake Ontario. We had a fast ferry to go to Toronto for a hot minute, but we didn't have enough uh, money interest to keep it going. Anyway, it's a it's a fantastic little town known for Frederick Douglass and um, Susan B. Anthony. It's known for Xerox, Kodak, Kodak, and Fashion Long. Um, and U of R actually has them, uh, because, you know, cameras have gone digital, like the number one employer now is U of R. Like, so, but it's got this beautiful long history of nurseries. Um, we're known for back in the early days that the, we, we were a uh, starting place for many urban planners and nurseries. Anyway, a little bit about Rochester. Um, I'm hoping to share about four chapters, kicking it off with Get Real Science, which is my baby. It's the teacher education program, but it's also my design space, a collaborative design space for justice-centered, ambitious science teaching has been for the entire time. I, when I went to Rochester, there wasn't a science teacher education program in place. So I got to create it from scratch. And I said, how would I want that to be if I took seriously the, the um, commitment to graduate um, people who have a strong appreciation for, commitment to, competence with, um, a, a very different kind of science education than they experience disorders. So I'm gonna share that baby with you. And then that led to this JUST framework. Um, the first articulation of it, like Ron said, we've been doing the work for a while, but it's kind of messy and complicated. So it's the question of like, how would I operationalize that? in like words to say, this is what we do. And it was a scary thing to share that with our friend Todd Campbell, like the first time, because it's like always, you know, in process. And then from that, we said, okay, how would we live this in the first unit of a school year? Like if we're gonna put this into practice and explain to kids, show kids that they're gonna have different experiences this year than they've had in science classrooms before, how would we do that? And then finally, what are we doing with those experiences um, in network professional learning communities across Connecticut, Rochester, and uh, Islandwood, Washington? So Get Real Science is a 15-month scaffold and master's program. Um, so the, the unique part about it is that we use out-of-school learning to teach experiences as precursors for being able to teach the way we are working toward in, in school classrooms. And I'll make that more clear in a minute. Um, I think it's really important that we all spend time future dreaming. Like if we're quiet and we say, okay, I wanna walk into a classroom, what do I wanna see? Ideally, what do I wanna see? Can you name those practices? Can you name what you would see here? I'm just inviting you to take a minute or two. Let me make you geek out if you saw your teacher students, like your, your teacher ed candidates doing, or any teacher. They seem engaged. Awesome. You can share, shout out. I think I love that. Anybody else have things that they know? Talking to students and listening. Talking and listening to students, love that. Students talking and listening to each other. Yeah. Students being the source of expertise in the room. About science. About science, yeah. I would say teachers continuing their own education love that. in service. Yeah. 
it's hard to see that in the classroom, but that, that you see evidence that that's, that they're sort of staying cutting edge with what we know. Any other pressing thoughts? I had this wonderful experience, I think it was three years ago, and I felt like I was on caffeine high. Like I walked into Sarah's classroom um, and Miss Nagy's classroom, and she was a pre service teacher at the time, and she's teaching in an urban classroom. Um, one that was struggling a bit, um, which is a whole other story, but oh my gosh, was I like in tears with what was happening. Like she, the, the energy in the room was palpable. She greeted all of the kids and immediately asked their predictions for how temperature and solubility would react. Um, first thing on the, on the wall, she had like demonstrations, the, the space was energetic and she started with student ideas. She had, this, had them go to this paradox and said, okay, <laughs> once I told a chemistry joke, there was no reaction. <laughs> and I guess she starts with a meme every day and says, okay, your current options are A, wow, Miss Nagy, you're so cool and funny. I'd hire you as a chem teacher. B, this meme was okay, but you could do better. C, this was boring. And like laughter and joy was a part of her room, right? And if you could see, I don't know if you guys know the I Am Scientist posters, but these are a free set of posters and resources. If you don't know them, you should write them down. They tell all of the fully human like aspects of a scientist and they show scientists from all different groups doing all kinds of different sciences. There's definitely a sense of belonging in that classroom. She has, Formal vocabulary going, informal vocabulary going, numbers going, visualizations going, um, demonstrations going, modeling going, all like, and the kids were up and at them at three different stations doing the work authentically, but their language was val val valuable and valid sense-making tools, right? Like, if, and some of the off-task stuff is necessary to be part of the on-task stuff, right? Anyway, if I like I got all goosebumps and then I had to go to a faculty meeting and pour them because I had to hear all about it because I was so excited. But to teach like Sarah, we have some challenges. Ooh, there's um that we all know about, right? There's an apprenticeship of observation, which means we've seen school for all of our lives and we think we know it and we can't imagine something different. That's a challenge. There's a challenge of institutional inertia that even if Sarah wants to do things differently, East High may not want to do things differently. Challenges of enactment and complexity, the stuff that she did that day, right? That's hard stuff. How to build a, a coherent um, explanation with diverse components coming from the different groups in the room, that's hard. And then there's inequity going on. like, And that's all around our culture that comes into the classroom. And kids, I'm not going to read exactly from the sides, but kids have different experiences with school. Right? They have different relationships with science and that affects what we're able to do. And we have to take that seriously if we actually care about all of our students. So we probably have all thought about core practices before. Um, teaching well depends on having a flexible repertoire of high leverage strategies and techniques that can be deployed quickly and with good judgment. Fully believe that. Fully think ambitious science teaching or other core practices are super helpful, especially to novices. However, my work is built on the notion that it's not just knowing and being able to do, it's a sense of becoming a certain kind of teacher. It's about a professional identity. Oh, that's not me, thankfully. Okay. Um, teacher as professional identity development. And I lean a lot on Jim G's work. So like participation to develop a, a new kind of identity you have to participate in the authentic practices of that discourse. And I love this definition of capability discourse because it problematizes the simplistic notion that it's just about knowing and being able to do, right? It's so much more than that. Being a uh, NGSS secondary teacher, science teacher committed to social justice, right? There's a certain way of combining and integrating language, actions, interactions, ways of thinking, believing, valuing, using various symbol systems, tools, and objects to enact a socially recognizable identity. That's a lot, right? And it's much more complicated than just knowing and being able to do. So we need to give Sarah and her colleagues authentic participation in these, in these rich spaces, right? But identity doesn't come for participation. That's necessary, but insufficient. Identity happens when that participation is recognized by self and others as being valid, important, and valuable, right? 
So we gotta take care of both of those things. Um, and not all opportunities are equal. So Nyla Nasir wrote this great paper with Victoria Hand in 2000, I think too. Um, she compared uh, basketball learning opportunities for kids, um, I mean, math learning opportunities for kids doing basketball versus in the classroom. And she, they beautifully document the differences of opportunities to learn and access to identity resources or learning resources that are present in basketball that are not present in especially the way most classrooms run, right? The positioning, central positioning, if they're gonna do math as statisticians in basketball, how active they are, how much agency they have, how, how there's a, an authentic sense of accountability, right? Also the support that they have with experts around the room, feedback, ongoing feedback and recognition by people who matter to them, right? So we can take lessons for that in teacher ed and say, okay, so how do we provide those things for our, our students? We need to give them participation that's authentic. So it's gotta be some version of messy, complex, unpredictable, non-linear, non long-term. We need to give them access to authentic tools, conceptual as well as physical, social tools, collaborative and creative. It's gotta require that creativity and that benefit from it. And it prioritizes relationships. But some of the challenges of this are is that novices Engaging all that, that's hard, right? Like throwing them in, ah, right? That's like a recipe for disaster and will actually damage the identity versus nurture the identity. Then the institutional inertia we already talked about. Recognition, we need to provide recognition that's meaningful. So Spartan Prusak write about telling identities and they say that your identity is the story that's told. It is the stories, right? The stories you tell about yourself or the stories that significant narrators, those who matter to you, are telling about you. So we have to pay attention to who's that, how we give our pre-service teachers opportunities to be recognized. Um, where do we give them opportunities to tell stories? And the feedback and assessments, do they align with this ambitious practice? Okay, so these, these are my favorite three. And we can think about it for both the learners and the teacher learners. So Jinji writes in his, I think, re relatively famous book about what video games have to teach us about learning. And if you haven't checked that out, definitely check it out because it's it's pretty cool. But he says if there's a if somebody's going in with a damaged identity or developing a brand new identity, there are three components that are necessary. We need to give them meaningful opportunities to try and fail. Reasons to invest a lot of effort and a high likelihood of experiencing meaningful success. Okay, meaningful reasons to put to try and and not have it all go well. Reasons to invest a lot of energy and a high likelihood of success. So that's how I designed the Get Real Science program. Um, specifically, it's a scaffolded program uh, based on Mark Winchell's paper about how there's always dilemmas for learning how to teach in a reform based way. First dilemma that we take on is conceptual. So I take my master's students out to a rural community for the whole summer A, and they do science in that rural community, in those places, and I am their teacher. So they experience as learners, what in the world is April talking about, which she says, reform-minded science teaching committed to social justice. And we start to unpack culturally sustaining teaching from that lens. They turn around then and take their experiences as learners and design a five-day camp for middle school youth in that rural community. So now they they do this, this, this thing that we all know teachers have to do. How do I scaffold this experience enough where novices will experience meaningful success while leave it open enough that they have voice and choice like I did just a semester before? And how do I do that in collaboration with the community? So they're advising me as teachers, we are learners first of a culture that's now on our own. So we spent a whole summer doing that. And before we then go to our third phase, which is um, they, they start in schools observing, but we also run an after school club in an urban context called Science Stars. Students tackling authentic and relevant science. And we prioritize science that the kids would love. Like we study BPA in our bodies. We study um, our meat, our lives, our story. They wanted to study the science of teen depression at East High. We make movies about it. We literally run to out the theater and put their names in lights. And they use their youth culture to tell their science documentary stories. 
And all of that informal stuff that our teachers get to do means that they're prioritizing relationships, they're prioritizing learning culture, they're prioritizing engagement, they're prioritizing the things that get sucked out of school that are so consequential for school kids, especially kids who don't identify with science or school as being a safe place for them. And lastly, they take on the conceptual, pedagogical, cultural, and political dilemmas. But by that time, by the time their student teaching them, they've seen that work. They've seen that kids can learn science in a deep and meaningful way and have positive relationships with it. So that they know that the kids are gonna do well on those standardized tests at the end of the year, but also enjoy the process, see themselves in the work that gets done. And the recognition work we do happens along the way. We've, I, I wrote a book a while ago on blogging. We used to have a, a, a all our pre-service teachers blogged their experience to the public. How would you ex explain why this matters to the, a lay person in a, in a professional blog? They do the teaching in pairs. So they have their peers as recognition work. And we bring the press out for the kids at every chance. So like the recognition work for the kids is just as important as the recognition work for the teachers. So this is a Get Real Science camp in a, in a at a glance. Um, it's not the prettiest picture, but whatever. We learn from students and communities from non-dominant cultures first before they go in and teach. So this is kind of fun. Um, I want you just to watch this little video clip and notice where, where both the kids and the teachers would have multiple opportunities to try and fail in the setting. Reasons to invest a heck of a lot of energy, right? Not because I assigned it, but because there's kids showing up at this camp, right? That you have a relationship with and, and a high likelihood of experiencing meaningful success. I'll move my Zoom thing. Just so you know, when I first saw this, I cried, literally. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be sound, but you may need to share your sound in the uh, Zoom link. Um, do we want to do it again or should we? If the link could just be put in the chat, we can watch it on our own time. All right, I will do that. Sorry about that. All of this technology means. Almost in the way. <laughs> literally. I, right, literally. Um, so I'm sure you can appreciate the, the opportunities to try reasons to invest a lot of energy and meaningful success. Mm -hmm. But then how do we operationalize that, right? We did that for years and years and years. And so now how do we put that in words so that other people can do that and so that teachers can take that out into the field? And so, oops, I should go to the screen share. Um, this is our attempt at that. And our, <laughs> our colleague who you might have met at Heidi Carlone used this phrase called a sacrificial text. And I love that, like putting something out there and letting it just be editable, right? We're gonna start with something and it is so scary. It's so scary to put something out there and like, I don't know if people are gonna like it and I'm missing something big, but it has also served as our anchor um, really quickly. Like the teachers have taken up the framework and they point to sections. So let me unpack that a little bit with, for you. First, conceptually, what in the world is this thing that I'm trying to share with you? Let me see. Do I, can I move that? No. 
Okay, it says, what is justice-centered ambitious science teaching? And it's meant to be a set of high leverage practices, just like ambitious science teaching or other core practices. So it's meant to be a set of high leverage practices that synthesizes core practices in science, we call AST or ambitious science teaching, with the literature on how to center justice. So how do we put those together and offer core practices for justice centering? And, and really it is across the, the field. It's not just uh, science, but it's gotta be grounded in critical consciousness. Somebody said um, on the Zoom call, the teachers are doing the work in the background, right? Critical consciousness is the notion that we can see inequity and we take action and it's work, right? To see, especially if we're white, especially if we're male, especially if we're heterosexual, there's a lot of privilege that we have to do. If we have a lot of privilege, we have to do more work, right? To try to understand the ocean that we're swimming in because it's sort of all ours. Anyway, grounded critical consciousness, responsive to and sustain students, cultures, and communities, dependent on teachers' interpretive power to invite, recognize, and build on students' expansive sense-making repertoires, and committed to naming and disrupting oppression and justice in society. And that is actually <laughs> came out yesterday. So skip that under review. <laughs> I should have changed that. Um, so it starts with ambitious science teaching, and these are our, the science folks' core practices, planning for engagement with core ideas. So we start by saying, all right, we got to plan with ideas that have a lot of explanatory power in science, right? got to pick those out because those are going to anchor us. We're going to elicit students' ideas. We always have to start where the kids come from. We support ongoing changes in thinking by making their thinking visible, by giving them new ideas, helping them revise their thinking over time, and finally pressing them for evidence-based explanations. That probably aligns with all of the fields in the room. Like this is pretty core, like how do people learn? We're building on that and that's awesome. It aligns very well with next generation science standards, which means that the change that's going through the country, we're gonna to respond to it very well with AST. It also serves two really important equity goals. Like everyone says, we need to give all students deep and rigorous learning, right? We need to give them access to the culture of learning, access to the culture of power, sorry. And we also, this is about doing science to learn science, right? Using the science and engineering practices to learn science. So that work is really all about nurturing positive identities and achievement in science. Awesome, right? Great, however, Necessary, but insufficient because it doesn't disrupt the status quo. There are more critical notions of equity that we keep ignoring when we just say inclusion, when we just say access to the dominant culture. People who are not in the dominant culture, like I'm not represented there. Like I can play your game, but what if, what if the game then changes so that I'm welcome? The diversity that I bring is embraced and science is better for it, right? And what if we use the learning that we're doing in school, not just for a test score, but for a purpose that matters more? So we draw on Philip, Philip and Azevedo's four equity discourses. They wrote a paper that they meant for out of school time learning, but it's getting taken up in in school learning all the time. They highlight, sorry, they highlight um, the first two equity discourses are rigor and identity, basically, what we just talked about with ambitious science teaching. You can see all that circled. But then there's equity discourses three and four focus on expanding what counts for science, expanding the, the valid and valued sense-making repertoires that are invited and uh, celebrated and counted as like outcomes in themselves as well as how do we use the science we're learning for social transformation? How do we use it to, to do good in our community in a way that honors our community? So this is the JUST framework and you'll see in the, in the Get Real Science program, it's the summer. So it'll pull on um, the summer that I, I spend with my graduate students before we have kids and the second half of the summer where we have kids in the camp. So planning to be, so planning, for important science ideas, yes. We still do the ambitious science teaching, it matters, but we do it in a way that we know is meaningful to the youth. Not just relevant to the youth, like, oh yeah, kids in general like this, but who are the youth in the room and what will they find meaningful? And in order to answer that question, we gotta learn about the culture, 
right? So quadrant one is about spending time and energy learning about a culture that's different from yours. And you can learn about that, that culture in many different ways. We do science the spaces. We have an advisory panel of previous campers, kids and teachers and school board members and the mayor comes and we put posters of possibility of what we want the camp maybe to focus on and they weigh in. So one of the kids said, well, I have a question. Why does the why do the strawberries that I buy at the grocery store taste chemically? What a great question, right? So that kicked off Loyal to Soil. Loyal to Soil decided to focus on why do, do strawberries grown different places taste different? Chemically, some taste chemically. Um, the second, eliciting student ideas, we pull them out to legitimizing community stories. Here's a story for you. <laughs> So one of my research teacher group focused on water because as you can see, we live by Lake Ontario and that was really, that's an important part of this rural communities culture. So they were gonna do like, let's let's study why water is important to sodas. Okay, but that was kind of generic, right? Like, and I was like, I can only push you so far. Why are strawberries tasting chemically? Like, that's cool. Let's study water. Oh, okay. But they started and the kids actually, they were out play space. They were out in their neighbor in their schoolyard. And they said, oh yeah, that's the water we drink of on drink out of before every sporting event, this water in the drainage ditch. It tastes better than Gatorade. Do you, do you, do you see Ron Gray's face right here? <laughs> that is the right face. Like you're, you're, you're drinking out of the drainage ditch before every sporting event. Okay, well, that's our new anchoring phenomenon, right? So they revamped, I mean, they had water as a plan, but then they'd start to look at the watershed, right? And they started to look where, if the water comes from here, whose farms is it going through? What, what pavement is it going through to get to there, right? And then they tasted, they tested that water. They didn't taste the water. They tested the water and they're like, oh my gosh, we shouldn't be drinking that. Right. And then the kid, one of the kids in the group goes, yeah, they pollute around one of my favorite ponds. And so they so they took a walking field trip to this pond and they saw the trash around and they picked it up as part of, the, you know, what they were doing in camp. They tested and it was healthy. And so they named those that that like the macroinvertebrates, fish food, like they use kids language. Right. And then that becomes a thing that I'll show you in a minute. I'm taking my own punch on the way. Um, so legitimizing student stories and community stories. Third, um, we still, of course, support ongoing changes in thinking, but we do it with varied local and diverse expertise. So we pull that out, right? So Loyal to Soil ended up going to Burnup's Farms, which is a very highly respected um, farmer's market in this tiny little town. And she said, I have fields, the woman who owns it. I have fields over there where we grow our good strawberries and I have fields over there where we grow our great strawberries. And so we came to study what makes the soil different from the good versus the great strawberries. But while we were there, one of the migrant farm workers was there and one of the kids and the farm, migrant farm workers started talking in Spanish and gesturing and like having this whole rich conversation about the soil that that the kid then brought back to the, the science, right? And could inform that. So this beautiful, like, translanguaging opportunity you don't plan for, right? That you just, oh, just give me goosebumps. Anyway, but it's not just local expertise, right? You can also diversify the expertise. They, they act, use the translanguaging, the sense-making expertise in the camp, in the camper and in the mig migrant farm worker. Last, pressing for evidence-based explanations. Absolutely, but for what purpose? If it has a purpose beyond school, how much more motivating is that? How much more important is that? So we always have a, a public showcase for the families where the kids sit, are offer the implications. The, the findings don't start at, the findings don't end at results. They have to do the so what for my community. So they come and they share and the, their families come and I could tell you more goosebumpy moments about kids at teenager angsty times who would not talk to her mom or grandma, but put the invite on her refrigerator door and both mom and grandma took that as a, I want you to be there. She stood in her lab coat and wanted her picture taken with mom and grandma. Like it was, anyway, these are amazing days. And that, that um, they put up a sign at that creek 
that they cl cleaned up the, pol the, the pollution and said, we don't trash your home, so don't trash ours, we live here. So like action based on their science. So this, this is how it takes that up, right? So using the top half, using science for social transformation, that was, that was equity discourse four, if you remember, that top half does that. It says, I'm gonna use science for a purpose. I'm gonna plan for it. And then we're gonna position students to do it. Um, Daniel Morales Doyle, if you haven't met him yet, you should have him come. Have you had him come? Oh, Danny is a, just an incredible human. I, I'm sorry, I don't know how, why the, I don't know. Oh, can I just put it, exit out? Yeah, you can just exit out. Okay. He wrote, the students who presented at Family Science Site were positioned as producers of scientific knowledge. Through this experience, students' commitment to the communities and cultures of origin were strengthened as they recognized the value of their own culture and competence in that culture. Meanwhile, they also reflected upon their agency to impact issues in their community and in the broader world. What more do we want, right? Like that, goosebumps, right? And if you think about Gloria Ladson Billings, who in 1995 is like the starter of how do we do this justice centering, cultural competence, right? Meaningful learning and taking change. She gets so frustrated with us because we keep ignoring that third one like positioning kids to make change, do something about it. We say, oh, it's relevant. And we call that culturally relevant. She doesn't call it culturally relevant. She wants us to get to that number three. And then the bottom half, expanding what counts as science. We do that in just two, legitimizing community stories, and just three, revising thinking with community and diverse expertise. So we hit these, but we get these through ambitious science teaching, right? We're doing it as connected to. However, you can't do all that work. Oh, sorry, bottom half. Um, again, Nayla Nasir, I just love her. One insight relevant to teaching is that instruction should be organized to invite diversity in pathways of participation in learning activities and bring multiple knowledges to bear on learning academic content. If we know that learning at best engages a multiplicity of cultural repertoires of practice and involves multiple representations and way of, ways of knowing, then it is imperative that teaching start from a place of respecting that range of knowledge and epistemologies that learners bring to learning settings and have the capacity to connect the learning and provide a range of entryways in. So what we're talking about here is a braiding work. Like you'll see in the paper, if you read the paper that came out, it's about braiding. It's about braiding local culture with science objectives or disciplinary objectives. And that's hard, but we gotta practice it. So I also threw Ron Gray's paper, recent paper there in my life. Marty's the last one. <laughs> like, how cool is it that you start like this the study of if you draw out all of the connections at the beginning, they become sense making repertoires for the rest of the unit, right? So we need ways of drawing out those stories. But we have to to do that work. I did change it there. Okay. Um, that we add just zero in critical consciousness. So critical consciousness, obviously we need to keep working on that, but we also have to nurture a critical, welcoming and joyful community that starts and continues on throughout, right? Like if we don't practice joy first, if we don't prioritize relationships, all of this risk taking we're asking kids to do, that won't be safe for them, right? We have to have time to laugh. Okay, so we're using this in a project. We said, what if we could create a unit that starts back after COVID? What would it look like? And so we created a culture setting first unit and it was our future dream. How much time do I have? Am I too late? Uh, about 10 minutes. Okay. So here's another video. Do we want to- I have the link ready for people on Zoom. You're so good. These are graduates of my program, which is another takeaway I wanted to share with you is like, the graduates of our program, let me see. <laughs> the graduates of our program are like our richest like resource, our collaborators. So note, note that they came together with me after their, this is their first year of teaching and COVID hit. Hmm. Okay, so we, we dropped this up together.
So that was our attempt at, at um, saying what we would like to see. I think I lost my slides. You stop sharing. Yeah. I think I'm back to Zoom. Start sharing again. Perfect. Yeah. Click that one. Start sharing. And then which one do I click? Yeah, that one. That very first one. Perfect. Oh, thanks. I would not recommend doing all eight practices in the first unit. I don't know. It's just dumb. <laughs> But conceptually, it's the idea that if we started the school year out strong, that would set the culture and we could build on that. It's a model of kinds of engagement kids could expect. It needs to be adapted to local context. It also serves as a pre-assessment for kids, for teachers, right? Like, let's try designing an experiment. Let's see what you know about that stuff. The power of preview, um, that's what one of my graduates calls it. Like, remember back in the first unit when we, right, like that helps, and groundwork for critical caring and joyful community. Some of the things we did was we started with an identity map. Um, so who are you and how does that impact the science that we get to do in our classroom? We identity mapped Mae Jemison first and learned all about her background and how that impacted the astronaut and human, you know, fully human scientists that she became. We did the localized injustice and anchoring phenomenon. So you can see we named communities and they looked at the the COVID cases and they started asking questions about why, but we did it with an asset-based lens. So the multi-generational caring that happens in uh, in our city. And you can see also these, these are our uh, graduates who took charge of each of these lessons and what year they graduated. We model phenomenon in context. So our, di our diagram to describe our ambitious science teaching models have a section for equity. So like the equity cuts across, right? Because it's part of the context. So you make space for that. Um, they led a uh, student-led experimental design that they loved. So there's value in having a certain amount of materials that they could choose from. They designed and conduct their own investigations and let them make the mistakes of changing community variables at the same time and try to figure out what they can say from that because those are the productive mistakes that we care about. But let's stick with them. And we connect with the community both ways. So we have brought medical mentors in, but this is from James in the South Bronx. He had his, his kids decided to take all the misinformation that was out there about COVID and create a FAQ page after they, they like figured out the, you guys know the CRAP test? It's some way of, I don't know what it all stands for. Is, is the resource current? Is it reputable? Like it's got a critical literacy component to help kids understand what they should trust. And lastly, this is the network now. So the, our grant from that culture setting unit, we've got professional learning communities all networked in Connecticut and Rochester and Islandwood. And they do, this is just Bree's PLC of Chem Crew. There were three Get Real Science graduates and one colleague. Um, the, during the summer, we worked on our critical consciousness and ambitious pedagogy. They did lesson study while they implemented the common practice, I mean, the common unit. And then they um, identified particular just practices they wanted to continue. They worked for the year on design-based implementation research. They identified a problem, a persistent problem in practice, and they studied iteration, iterations of that. Um, this group studied uh, questioning, higher order questioning. I didn't know that build. And lastly, this is my last slide, like an example of just practices Okay, we're using a rocket launch as our core anchoring phenomenon, but following Ron Gray's uh, et al's paper, Marty, yeah, Marty's paper, we asked the question of like, where do you see the same thing, things like this happening in your world? So come and tell stories about that. And whatever those things are, I, oh, I think a bomb exploding might be like that. What about a slingshot? And they unpack the ways in which they're the same or different and they move those things on a physical target closer or, or farther away from the science explanation of the thing in the middle as a way to draw out the stories of the kids. Um, and the more phenomenon we get on the target, the better, because it all they all help us learn. So we're writing um, all of those teachers, the lead teachers, we're working on a book uh, for teachers by teachers of these just practices that will share um, how to take the framework and live it in everyday practice.
That's it. That's my team. That's yeah. You know Todd Campbell. He's up in the top corner. I think he came before. Mm -hmm. Cipio is from Islandwood. Yeah, and I works with Todd. And Yang worked with me, but is now a postdoc at Northwestern. The end. Okay, thank you. Um, online folks, you're welcome to just raise your hand and um, and chat. Otherwise, um, feel free to type something in, and I'll I'll read it out loud for for questions. Um, whatever you would like to do, Christina, do you want to go ahead, and we'll jump over to the room. Oh, you're talking to me. I was clapping, but um, I do actually have a question. I was going to wait, but I'll hop on it. Um, first of all, Dr. Lumen, thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry I can't be in person, but I'm sick. And turns out so is my kid. Um, so I have to stay home. I was reading um your conference paper, because that's what I could find two days ago, one day before your journal paper came out. Uh, basically, I'm wondering how you have approached um sort of taking like the out-of-school context and um, translating it into formal education spaces and any insights you you have for that i also noticed in your presentation you talked about in your teacher prep program having them do like summer camps and stuff and i'm really fascinated by that because i've kind of walked in both spaces but have struggled to bring them together i guess yeah i think that's a really good question i think some of the links that help bring them together are using similar frameworks so ambitious science teaching we use all the language like of ambitious science teaching and culturally sustaining pedagogy from the get-go. So that's how they learn how to think about planning from the beginning. Um, and they learn like anchoring phenomenon can be place-based. And so I think that they use like all of that same language when they start planning for their student teaching experiences or field-based experiences. And I'm still there. So I'm also a bridge, right? Like at least uh, so the so I always teach the core methods class, which is the first time that they're teaching a series, an innovative series of lessons in the classroom. So even if I didn't run the camp, which I usually do, but even if I wasn't there all summer, I know what experiences they've had and can draw on them as they do this innovative series of lessons. I think it's also really important as a scaffolding move for teacher ed to have an innovative series of lessons, like a shorter version, because cooperating teachers will often allow things for a short period of time that they may not feel comfortable letting happen for a longer period of time. So you can sort of, I always say, April's making me do it. Like blame me, but we're starting off with a justice-centered anchoring phenomenon and we're modeling and we're gonna do things that look very different than the classroom, right? And we're gonna try our hand at it. And then by that time they go, oh yeah, this is really cool. Like kids were engaged that I never saw engaged before. This just happened last week. And I fought her, this pre-service teacher. Like she was wanting to do the traditional, and I'm like, no. Anyway, she's not, I mean, it just fell the buy-in, right? Anyway, I think that those are some of the things that tie it together is that the human that, that connects the informal to the formal, but also the structures. Some of the language is similar. Any other thoughts? Thoughts are fine too. You can tell me where I'm wrong too. <laughs> so, um, I, I really loved all of like the context for the, the learning that the students were doing. A lot of it was place-based. It looked like there was field trips involved. And I also noticed that you were talking about design-based implementation research. So I'm just curious, have you run into any challenges in terms of trying to sustain this sort of learning over time. Yeah, I'm tired. If you have any insights in terms of just like that, the implementation piece over time. I do think as a teacher educator, it's hard because we design it new every single year, right? Because it's gotta be new for kids. Um, but for teachers, I, I honestly believe that, well, two things. One, I believe that there's a lot of work that goes into teaching and that where you put that work will either give you energy or suck it from you, right? So if you don't plan things where kids are engaged, then you're gonna use that same energy trying to get them to sit in their seats and do something and turn in their homework and all of the stuff that's not fun for anybody, right? So I think investing your energy up front to say ramen noodles, from a box that are organic and down the street that you eat all the time, 
get those materials in front of the kids, let them taste it, let them look at the ingredients, have a conversation about palm oil, bring them to the rainforest. That work is work. But then you go to class and they're like, Renee says, man, I have never seen them. So they were second time rounders taking biology and they were not having it for the whole year so far. And they're like, my gosh, this was so much fun. And fun being authentic fun, not like off task fun, right? Anyway, so I argue for, but I also think you can't do it all, right? And so, and you need a community. Like doing it together is so much easier than doing it alone. And then just taking pieces of it each year, um, you, you can build those experiences up. But yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> Back to that. <laughs> it's a great question. I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, um, so even just the remarks that you just made talking about like the, you know, the idea that you're tired and this is hard work and we have to come together. Is there an aspect of your work or the, the frameworks that you, you've referenced and, and talked about, about how this process of identity building um, engages us in reflecting on our own narratives and like a, a healing aspect of that? So many times as a person of color engaging in work, there's a there's a process of reflecting on our own complicitness to our own and um, participation and self-harm of our own communities. And so I'm just wondering if there's an aspect of your work that you've connected to, you've thought more about um, in regards to those ideas. Not enough. I think COVID has really amplify the need for that, for self-care, for caring for each other, for healing work that needs to happen, um, grace. Uh, I, I think that the number one thing that we've offered our communities is each other. Um, so like when COVID hit, these graduates were like, April, we need to get together and just be together. Like, we don't know what we're doing. We're in a really hard, school district and the challenge is like, okay, we're gonna go digital. Sure, that's great for everybody who has a computer at home. Like, what does that mean for my kids, right? Like there was just, so we spent a lot of time just being together. And I think staying connected with each other is one of the best gifts that we can give. Um, and also like, I'm also like, um, I'm a, non-grading person like I really believe that what we're doing is a shared sort of I don't know mission calling whatever right so I'm here to give you feedback and we're working toward it and if you can't do it all right now it's okay like it's a trajectory it's a it's a process so like I push you sometimes like I had to push Renee but there are other times where it's like yeah ultimately it's you know it can't happen all at once I don't know if I answered your question maybe somebody else in the room has a Another answer for Heather about how do we heal and help each other heal? I, I just find that it's often something that we do intuitively, but we don't acknowledge explicitly as that's part of the work. Yeah. And we can speak from it because we learn from these experiences and these projects that we engage in. And that it's been a critical thing that I've had to go back and reflect on like, oh, this was this wasn't just the work. It was a critical part of the work. And so I just invite you to consider all that um, as well. Uh, and it'd be interesting to hear um, your reflections. I really appreciate that. I, I, there's a scenario I, I come up across and I'd love your thoughts on it. And so in, in the graduate program, we kind of push them that we actually have used some of like the cast materials like Jessica Tong in your stuff. And, and um, to get them to start thinking about social justice and then to come up with an idea for a unit uh, that is social justice oriented. They don't go all the way through, but it's just like, what is a seed of an idea? Almost all of them are def deficit based. Mm. And so what I've struggled with is helping them see what, we'll see what the difference is in the first place. And I wonder if you have thoughts on how, how to help people see social justice phenomenon from an asset based perspective. What are we, what, what should they be looking for? That makes sense. Yeah, I, I, uh, the number one thing that I can offer is be in relationships with the communities you serve. Like in real relationships, break bread together. 
have them over for dinner, whoever they are, right? So like my Sonic Stars girls, the girls who made movies, it was, it was an all girls club, but their families were my families. Like we, we broke bread together. And so like when we studied food, Morgan's mom came in and made us this most amazing meal. Like, and that was part of our movie. And we talked about the cultural importance of food. So like, I don't think you, I think it's really, it's not hard to see, but like the richness of cultures that are different than yours, but you have to spend time with them. And you have to go, you have to approach that with cultural humility. Like you have to practice cultural humility and say, I want to know more, you know, tell me more invite me in like I come to your basketball game and like maybe like we can get, grab ice cream after or I don't know what it is churches Twitter lots of buildings says go to churches by all means go to churches you know because that, those are really important cultural spaces but wherever whatever is important to kids right that's how I, I think you learn to see the assets of other cultures Was, so I've been thinking about integrating informal science learning with teacher education um, for, for a while now, because simply because of the affordances, there's this um, very new lens of positionality, right? When you position yourself as a learner and someone affords you a specific immersive and rich and contextualized and learning experience, it's eye-opening the teachers to put themselves in that place. What are some challenges um, with regards to those very same aspects that you see when the same teachers have to then rely on their experiences have to design something for their students in classrooms. Yeah, it kind of brings back, I think it's similar to the first question for me. I, um, I think a lot of reflection being done in the moment, the out of school space. I think we who have, um, who have the intentions of, of supporting both out of school and in school space can help draw the connections, like help nurture that connection making. Um, I think similar frameworks and language helps, but um, I do think you have to really underscore the power, uh, the power of relationships, the power of being in place, the power of being learners first. Like, I think you have to name these things that need, that reach so much benefit and bring them in. Like we couldn't, not everybody can spend a summer in, in a rural community, right? But so neighborhood walks, like in the cast framework that Ron was talking about, like, like asset-based walks through the community where kids are the guides and you are the learner, right? How many times could you, do, how many ways could you be the learner? That's the goal, right? And, and it takes creative structures, especially if you can't be in the places. But places are so powerful and we need to get out in them. We don't have to go out into them all the time. I think Sam said something like, I see a lot of field-based stuff. We only take kids to the place once. And that's important to know because field trips are hard. Expensive. And expensive, hard resources, all of it, right? Taking kids out of school. One time, even one time for the school year, right? You can bring artifacts, artifacts back. You have you have shared experiences that you can draw from. Those are the spaces where the stories get told. You can the power of preview, right? Like you don't have to go out that often for it to, to really impact your class. Um, and I, I know we're at time. There's one really wonderful question on the chat though. And so I want to ask that. So if people need to start logging off, I appreciate it. Can we bring the quote, I'm tired into the curriculum from a lens, a social justice lens and the socio-political expectations placed upon minority women in academia and in teaching? Yeah, I think we have to, right? Especially for, for minoritized communities, the work is so much greater and it's not optional. Like as, as white people, we can, choose not to do the work and survive, right? It's not a possibility. So I think um, we have to lean into the ethics of care. I think we have to talk about the inequitable workload um, for our, our colleagues of color. I think um, we do need to do differently. 
Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel. I posed the question and I just wanted to say thank you very much for um, coming today and speaking on that. And, and really it was kind of inspired by your last comment about um, the active learning, taking them on field trips and being able to learn. And, and I come from a sociological lens and I just thought it was profound. Um, I was teaching, you know, a criminological theory and how we get people to conform to sociological behaviors. And I was literally crossing the street and I made an observation that the, the crosswalk signs tend to be all mothers and children with purses on their arms. And I thought, wow, here I am a teacher expected to walk my kid to school, follow all the rules, play by all the games. And it's geared symbolically towards me as a female in academia. And it just became a very profound field trip sort of moment to make that intersectional observation of gender and also this kind of socioeconomic status, because clearly I was walking across the street. Um, <laughs> so it became a profound observation. And I just wanted to support your ideas on this concept of can we bring that sort of into the curriculum in this active learning type of exercise? And I just, I think we can. So thank you very much for sharing today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, join me in thanking Dr. Lumen. We'll much appreciated. Um, I see Jeff, Angie, uh, Brian, or uh, 11.45, and I think it's a different Zoom link. Excellent. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming online.